Joining me on the channel today is Megan E. Freeman, author of the middle grade novel Alone, out now from Simon & Schuster. It's about a 12-year-old girl who wakes up one day to find her Colorado town strangely evacuated and herself utterly alone, relying on her own ingenuity to survive. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you today. Um, I always like to start at the beginning and explore your journey to becoming a published author. What sort of kid were you? You know, I, I have no idea how I was perceived by other people, but my memory of myself is that I was, I wanted very badly to be taken seriously by the adults around me. And I think that I was really hard on my little brother because he was just a normal kid just doing his thing. And I kind of felt like he was blowing my cover that I was trying to pass as an adult. You know, I think I, I think I was ambitious and precocious in that way. And, um, and really wanted to, to be listened to and to be heard. But at the same time, I also had a really rich imaginary life. And I, and I loved, you know, playing dress up and I loved playing pretend games with my brother and things like that. So my memory of myself is sort of, is sort of, there's this duality between wanting to be an adult much sooner than I needed to be and also having a really rich imaginary play life. What sort of books did you like reading as a kid? I, well, I loved historic, what I would now call historical fiction. I wouldn't have called it then at the time, but I loved things like Little Women and Little House on the Prairie. There was a series called The All of a Kind Family that was about a, a large Jewish family living in New York City at the, around the turn of the century and into World War I. I, I devoured those books. I loved, I loved I loved historical fiction and I, and it's only in reflecting that I realized that was true, but I also was reading this stuff that, that everybody was reading. I was reading Judy Bloom. I loved Harriet the Spy. Um, I loved things like the mixed up file from the mixed up files of Mrs. Baisley, Frank Weiler. I loved all of those books as well. How did you go from being a reader who loved books to wanting to publish your own work? Well, I had really great teachers who in elementary school introduced us to things like young, the young authors festival. And we would, we would make books, you know, like with cardboard and construction paper and contact paper and, and actually bind them and, and publish them. Right. <laughs> so I got a taste for, for writing something and giving it to someone and having it be received and get feedback pretty early. And it felt really, really good. And I think just naturally being a reader that, that felt like a form of communication that, that I could then participate in. And I, and I also felt a connection to the authors of the books that I was reading. So there was a part of me, I think that wanted to be in conversation that way. I remember discovering that Louisa May Alcott was born in 1867 and her, her daughter died in 1967 and I was born in 1967 and like there seemed like there was this this connection like somehow we were connected by these centuries and years and so so I think I wanted to be I wanted to be engaged with authors in that way as well and maybe engage with readers the way I felt engaged with those authors. That's really interesting. Totally off topic, but there's this. Network. Wait, sorry. Wait, did I have to. Did I say Louisa May Alcott? Yeah, I meant Laura Ingalls. I I have her back. It was Laura Ingalls Wilder. Laura Ingalls Wilder. I switched them. Oh <laughs> those, yeah, those nineteenth-century women with three names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But totally off topic. There's this Netflix series that I'm like obsessed with right now. And it, it, it's, oh God, now I forget the name, but it's all about like life after death. And the sixth oh, episode yeah. is about uh, these reincarnated kids, like these, these kids that they're born and they have these really profound memories of like their previous lives. And then they like test mm -hmm. them to see if they're like really accurate and they turn out to be accurate. Have you, mm -hmm. have you seen that at all? Oh, wow. No, but I totally love that idea. Yeah. But your story about how, like when you were a kid, you wanted to be an adult and how mm -hmm. you feel like that, like you feel this connection to um, Laura mm -hmm. Ingalls Wilder and like, anyway, mm -hmm. just got me thinking like, like her, about the reincarnation thing, but check out yeah. that series. No, it's like, cool. You, I will. I will. If, I'm gonna think of, of the title again, like off the top of my head, but it's um, it's called. I, I want to say it's called Surviving Death or something like that. Okay. And there's, so there's only six episodes, but 
the sixth episode on like the reincarnated kids blew my mind okay, so cool. much. That I, I, really, started, I went down the, <laughs> the YouTube rabbit hole uh-huh. on like reincarnated <laughs> kids after that. Well, and I used Only to awesome. imagine, no, I told, it's totally appealing to me. And I used to fantasize yeah. when I was a kid, like I'd be in the car with my mom and we'd be going somewhere. I used to fantasize, like, what if we come around the corner and they're standing on the corner are Laura Ingalls Wilder and her mother and her sisters. And they're just completely baffled by this. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles. They're completely baffled by this urban crazy setting and cars and stoplights. And we would need to stop. And I would, in, I would explain that it is safe to get in the car. And I would tell, I would give them context for where they are. Like I, I played those games in my head all the time of sort of time traveling. And what would it be like if I went back there or if they came forward or, you know, yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, I, I yeah I do I do as as well. Um, fascinating. Um, what tell us about the day that you found out your book was going to be published? Uh, that's that's fun. I my agent tends to do her emailing late at night. I go to bed fairly early, and and she's also on the Pacific Coast, and I'm in Central Time or in Mountain Time, so I tend to get emails from her in the morning when I wake up. And I remember I was lying in bed and I was checking my phone and my husband was shaving in the other room. And I saw this email from her that said offer with like four exclamation points. And, and it was the offer from Simon and Schuster. And I remember sitting up in bed and looking at my phone and it was like, I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing. You know, it it didn't make sense. And I called my husband and I said, oh my God, I think, I think this is, I think I have a book, a, a book offer. So that was, that's the most clarifying moment that was really, really thrilling. But then, you know, what I didn't, what I didn't appreciate and what I have come to appreciate is it's a long process. Like there's back and forth. And so to, to have a book deal, you know, I remember the moment I got the offer, but it was weeks and months before we knew that this was what we were going to do and that we were going to go forward with this house and with this editor and so forth and so on. So it, it isn't, it, it wasn't just one sort of event. But that moment of receiving the news that I had an offer in hand was pretty thrilling. Um, how how long were you on sub? Had you been waiting for a while, and you kind of gave stopped thinking about it? Or you know, I had stopped thinking about it. I was working on other stuff, and 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 I was you know I had sort of given it up to the universe and you know yeah. serenity prayer stuff. Like I can't control it. It'll be what it'll be. <laughs> But it wasn't terribly long. We sent it out. I think she sent out um, the first round was in March and we had an offer in late May. So, or oh, mid-May, that's... something around there. So it, it wasn't very long. And I know she had had conversations with all of the editors in advance of sending them the manuscript. So she had been doing a lot of legwork and sort of laying the groundwork beforehand. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was pretty quick. And what's a misconception about publishing that you had prior to being published that has now changed? <laughs> um, I, I didn't have, you know, I, I, I really didn't have much of, an, of in, any insight into what went on behind the scenes. So I didn't have, a, I don't know that I had a lot of misconceptions, but I, I had an absence of, of information. And, and one of the things that has surprised me has been how uh, um, dynamic the industry is in terms of people coming and going and changes that happen. And given how long it takes to traditionally publish a book, you know, I think I sold this one in 2019 and it came out a week ago. So two years, give or take 18 months, something like that. Um, and in that time, the, the editor that acquired my book left the imprint. Me too. Yep. And I didn't even know that was a thing. Like we've been orphaned, right? I didn't know that was a thing. So that was new yeah. to me. And then in the middle of everything, and, and I got lucky in that the agent that, that stepped in and took over was fabulous. And we had a wonderful time and the book is so much better because of her. So I feel incredibly lucky. And I know not everybody has that experience. Yeah. Was that was that true for you as well? Yeah, I had this experience. Yeah. She, yeah, yeah, she took over and she gave me really great feedback. And I was like, oh, I'm so lucky that mm-hmm. Uh, One, I got really great feedback from my acquiring editor. And then I got this whole second round of feedback from my new editor. And that was just like, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel very much the same way. But then in the middle of everything, Simon and Schuster 
announced that they were putting themselves up for sale, right? So, and and there was a big yeah. reorganization and some imprints were collapsed and and, and um, taken in under others. And so I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any awareness of how, and the word that keeps coming to mind is volatile, how volatile the industry is. I don't know that that's really the right word, but dynamic in that it, it you know, lots of people move around and people come and go. And so um, that really, that surprised me. Yeah. Definitely. So pitch your book. Tell us about it in your own words. Um, so, and here it is. <laughs> Alone is, um, it's a survival and adventure novel in verse. And it, I was first inspired to write it when I reread Island of the Blue Dolphins with my daughter when she was in middle school and we were in a book club mm -hmm. together. And we read that book. And that book, that book, for those of you who, who don't know it or have, don't remember it, it's, it's out of the 1960s and it's the story of a young woman based on a true event, a young woman who is left behind on the island that she lives on when her tribe is evacuated. They're not evacuated, but they leave and, and they leave her behind. And she lives on this island for 18 years, more or less by herself until she's found and brought to the mainland of Southern California. So we reread that book together as as a book club and the kids in the in the book club were really fascinated by the fact that she survived for so long on the island and i said to them the thing is though is that the island is her home and she's she's lived there her whole life so she's having to survive and she's having to survive alone but it's not like she has to figure out an, an alien environment or learn how to find fresh water the way i might be if i were dropped on an island right I, totally out of my element and i said to the kids in this meeting what would happen if you came home from school tomorrow and everybody in the town was gone and you were left behind? Because that's kind of what happens to her. And then I couldn't get that notion out of my head. So I decided I was going to write this book. And, and I started with a seventh grade girl who decides she's going to have a secret sleepover with two of her best friends. And they are gonna, she's going to lie to her mom and say she's at her dad's house, lie, at her, lie to her dad, say she's at her mom's house and then secretly go to her grandmother's house, which is empty. And they're gonna have this, this um, secret sleepover and not tell any of the adults. But of course, at the last minute, her friends can't come. So she's left behind and, the, and she wakes up the next morning and the entire town is evacuated and she has to figure out what's going on. And so, and it starts off, she tries to call, of course she can't call, the cell phones aren't working. She tries to get on the computer. You know, I make all those things really hard for her. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, she has to figure out how to survive and how to get along. And she doesn't know exactly why the evacuation happened. So she's not sure if there's an external threat that she needs to be worried about or not. Um, she's not sure when mm -hmm. and if they're going to be coming back. She doesn't even know if her parents realize she's been left behind because they each think she was with the other. And if they can't communicate, they may think she's fine. So that's the premise that yeah. unfolds. And then three years, three, little more than three years later, you know, she's still there by herself. So she's there a long time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That sounds like a really exciting concept and probably really, really fun to write. Yeah. What was maybe like the funnest, funnest part of that writing process? You know, when I, when I first wrote it, I wrote it in prose and I wrote it in a very chronological narrative arc in third person voice um, and past tense. And I wasn't getting any traction with age. I was getting traction, but I wasn't, nothing was converting to offers of representation. And I went back and I did a massive sort of analysis of the feedback that I've gotten and, and really trying to look at it from 30,000 feet and, 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 and look at it objectively. And I realized that I needed to rewrite the entire thing in verse. I was a poet for years before I was a novelist. And I was much more fluent in poetry than I was in prose. And as soon as I started rewriting it, I could, I could feel the difference that that made. And I could feel the flow. I found that flow and it wasn't, you know, the flow that I'd had before was flow driven by my curiosity about the story, about the narrative. But once I started writing in poetry, I felt the flow of the language. And it also opened up aspects of her experience that I hadn't pursued before her interior experience and her emotional and psychological and spiritual experience. And so that was really, really fun really fun. Oh, that sounds really fun, which, um, which kind of leads to uh, a, a similar question, which is what do your first drafts look like? I um, mean, in this case, the first draft was a prose and, and you, and yep. you changed it. To first. Um, is that, yep. 
yeah, now you're probably working on something new. So what, what does your mm -hmm. first draft for that look like? So the, I have two things. I have one thing that's out right now and one thing that's with critique partners and then another work that I've, that I'm sort of mulling. All of those have started with prose and even the ones that I have in, you know, in a drawer that hopefully will never see the light of day. <laughs> those all started with prose and, and I tend, I tend to sit down and write a fairly clean, you know, beginning to end draft um, and then go back and, and really tool it and play with it. Um, the, the, the inspirations come from really different places and I start with different things, but for the most part, my first drafts are pretty much like, I, I like NaNoWriMo and I, and I like the idea of set a word count goal, go, don't, don't perseverate over things. And as a poet, I have to say, it's really easy to perseverate over a comma, <laughs> you know, or one word. And that's not very productive and will get you, you know, nowhere fast. So I have, I tend to try to write the first drafts kind of in, in a linear forward momentum kind of fashion and then go back and play after that. And what's your favorite step? Is it drafting or revising? I think it's revising. I like, um, I, I really like collaborating with other people. I like feedback from critique partners. I loved going through the process with mm -hmm. my editor. Um, I like the I like the input of information and external points of view that help me see it differently, as well as point out things that opportunities that I might not be seeing or issues that I might not be seeing. I think I think that's I think I like that better than the actual generative drafting. Although when I get into that flow and I lose time and I'm not distracted, that is a really delicious feeling. That's a great place to be. What's been the best revision tip that you've gotten along the way? I think, well, when, when my editor first sent me her feedback, one of the things that she pointed out, there are a lot of things that happen in the book. And, and I said it in Colorado because that's where I live and I know it so well, but also because Colorado lends itself to survival challenges, right? You've got the changing of the seasons, you've got wildfires, you've got floods, um, storms, hail, all that kind of stuff. So, it, so the, the natural world can be a really lovely obstacle um, as well as wild animals and things like that. Um, and one of this, and I had a lot of those elements in the book and my editor was questioning some of them and, and thinking maybe it was too much or, you know, overkill. And she pointed out that, that she, she would like to see places where my main character tried really actively to do something about her situation. And then and whether she succeeded or failed, that was a different question, but as opposed to just sort of taking things as they come, rather, you know, put something out there, make an effort. When I had a couple of places like that, but, um, but I think there, there was room for more. And, I, and when I read her, her notes and was thinking about that, I went back and looked at some of those scenes. I had a scene, I, I don't know if you follow Colorado News at all, but in, in 2013, we had massive flooding on the front range where I live and people died and homes were washed away. Whole towns were washed away. The National Guard had to fly in and evacuate people by helicopter, you know, and it took years. I mean, in some places it still hasn't, we still haven't repaired and recovered. So it was, it was a very major event. And, and I was drafting this book at that time. And so I put a flood in the story, but in the story, she was just standing on the side of the creek and she was watching the water rise and she was seeing all the things that were being washed away, go past. And she was just a witness to it. And I, I had that moment of like, oh, she needs to fall in. <laughs> like she actually needs to be, her life needs to be threatened by this event, not just um, sort of existentially, but literally. So there were things like that, that my editor pointed out that absolutely made the story so much more dynamic and so much more interesting and also gave the character so much more agency. And I think that was a really, a really big part of it. Are you a perfectionist or a chaos artist? I'm a perfectionist for sure. I'm a, I don't know if you know that Enneagram, but I'm a two or no, I'm a one on the Enneagram, which is the reformer or sometimes oh. called the perfectionist. So I, I, I mean, I have oh, to, yeah. I have to force myself to click send on emails because I'll reread it three or four times before I'll send it to somebody. And, you know, that's a good way to waste a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, re I definitely relate to that. Um, do you have a huge ego or are you humble and demure? 
Oh, I don't think anyone has ever used the word demure for me ever. Um, <laughs> but I, and I don't have a huge ego. The egoic small self voice that I have heard for much of my life is really n nasty and critical and mean. And for a long time, mm -hmm. I made the mistake of thinking that that was me. And when I realized that it wasn't and that it was just that inner roommate who thought I needed her help. And I, I even gave her a name. I called her the headmistress because oh. she had that kind of exacting, you know, unforgiving, uncompromising, judgmental, harsh sort of tone. Um, and for a long time, I really, I thought that's who I was. And when I realized that, no, that's just a voice that, that came along at one point to try to help you out. And I named her and thanked her and dismissed her and, you know, gave her a cookie and told her she could go out to play <laughs> and that I didn't need her help. That, that helped a lot. Um, mm. That helped a lot. And I mean, I even used to think when people would say like, what animal would you be if you, if you weren't a human, what would you, what animal would you be? I would get this image of a, of a raptor, like a hawk or an eagle. And it was always, you know, talons and, and after I started doing that work and realizing, oh, she's not, she's not you and she's not helpful and you don't need to listen to her. Then I started seeing images of like a golden retriever, <laughs> you know, oh, much nicer animals and much, yeah, kinder. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't take much stock in what she says anymore. And I actually don't give her the microphone very often anymore either. So I've come a long way in that regard. <laughs> Nice. That's really good to hear. And that's really great advice too, for those of us who have a little bit too much of a perfectionist mm -hmm. vibe. Mm -hmm. Whenever we let something, something slip and then you're like, I don't mm -hmm. know, I let that, that slip, that right, little, exactly. that little typo go through where someone saw it and yep. I didn't catch it first. Yep, exactly. Um, are you a morning writer or an evening writer? You know, I, my best, my, my rhythm tends to be to use the morning to take care of the business of the world, you know, answer emails and, um, and deal with things like that. And then get in a groove in, in the writing in the, in the mid to late afternoon and into the evening. I, since I don't live alone and I am in a partnership, I have to adjust my cycles to my partners so that, um, we can have a, a coexistence together. I think if I lived completely alone with nobody, I would probably write from the middle of the afternoon way into the evening but I don't do that because it's sort of antisocial. Um, but I think that's probably my natural rhythm, you know? But when I'm doing, like if I'm in a really generative mode or I'm doing NaNoWriMo or something like that where I've got a really strict word count, I will start in the morning and I'll go until I'm finished. Um, so it's not, it's not hard and fast, but, but my natural rhythm is to take care of that other stuff first. Or maybe it's a form of procrastination. That's possible too. That, you know, the inbox and the allure of the inbox I prioritize that over getting to my, getting down to work. I don't know. Yeah, could be. I heard that some advice from um, Bobby Chu, who's an artist, and he said he doesn't check his email in the morning. And yeah. I'm like, oh, that's that's interesting. What a novel idea. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I have well, it's, failed it's, so a, far. it's addictive <laughs> though, too, right? Yeah. It's that feeling of what did I miss while I was asleep? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, are you a plotter or a pantser? Um, a little bit of both. I've done both in both in different situations with, with the book alone. I absolutely, it was absolutely plot driven, but I was also working off that idea of sort of emulating the Island of the blue dolphins and studying the structure of that. And the notion of, of, of a story that had a beginning, middle and end like that. Um, with the book that that it, that I have out to critique partners right now, the manuscript that they're reading, it, I completely pantsed it. And it came to me as a character and a voice and a setting. And I had no idea what his story was. So that, that was really, that was completely the opposite experience. Um, so it's, so it's somewhere in, and then I've, I have another manuscript out right now that's very much in the middle that I, I knew I sort of had three ideas I was interested in and topics that I wanted to tie in, but I wasn't sure how they would all weave together. So it was, it was a little bit of both. Was there ever a time in your life where you feared you would never be published? Um, I, I wouldn't use the word feared because I, I don't, I'm not afraid of too much. And 
and I'm, I'm very philosophical. It's going to be what it's going to be and I'll do my part and we'll see what happens. But, um, but there were, there was definitely a time where I was ready to give up on this particular project. And I was, I was just fatigued. I had been working on it for so long. Um, and I, I was kind of out of gas and I almost didn't go to the annual, our local SCBWI conference. And, and then when I decided I would go, I almost didn't sign up for a critique. I almost didn't sign up for the novel intensive, but I did. And I went and I got such great feedback from the agent critique and from the novel intensive that it, it completely re-energized me. And, and I found that new momentum that carried me, it carried me to my agent and ultimately to my book deal. But, you know, I think about if I hadn't gone to that conference, I don't, I, I don't know if I would have picked it up again because, and I had lost so much perspective oh. on it. Like I, I just didn't even know what it was anymore. And I didn't know if it was any good. And I, I was kind of tired of it, tired of the whole idea. So to have, have people see it and be interested and, you know, I was able to get that energy back from them. So, but I was, it wasn't that I was afraid oh. I wouldn't be published. It was more just that I almost gave up. Oh, wow. Don't give up. Don't um, give up. Would you like to be famous? Would I like to be famous? I would not like to be famous. <laughs> I, like my, I like my privacy um, and I like my freedom to move in the world. And, and I think famous people sacrifice a lot um, when they become famous. I would love to be known by children as, as a writer that they could count on and that they would, you know, that they could um, come to for wonderful stories. I would, I would love that. I would love to be known by, by young readers um, as an author that they, that they love to read, but no, I would not like to be famous. <laughs> if you could have any one non-supernatural talent or ability, what would it be? I think I would love to be able to fly. I think flying looks really fun. I have bird feeders outside my office window and I, I get hypnotized watching them. Non what? Oh, it has to be non-supernatural. Say it again non-supernatural so flying non-supernatural oh 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 okay ask me again i have okay. to hear the question again okay if you could have any non-supernatural talent or ability non what would it be so ah okay that yes i would be able to um play the piano play okay. the piano is like like that is that what we're talking about yeah, yeah. Um, without reading any music, I would like to just be able to sit down and play, either play what I hear or play what's in my head. Um, yes, I think people who can do that, it, it just looks like an extraordinary, it's like a language they can speak. And, mm -hmm. and I think that would be extraordinary. I would love that. But I would like what to be able you, to fly too. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on now? Um, I have a middle grade out with critique partners that I'm, I'm, I actually have a phone call with one of them this afternoon to hear, to hear her insights. So I'm excited. I'm really excited about that one. And I'm mulling a brand new, I think it's probably a YA that is, um, it's just starting to form in my head. I actually woke up really early this morning and was talking to my husband about the ideas. I'm just starting to get a handle on, on who the characters might be and what they might be up to. So that's, I mean, I have, I've written maybe 800 words of that. So it's very, very new. But it's fun to be kind of, you know, letting that marinate and and stew a little bit. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Um, everyone, check out Alone out from um, Megan Freeman. The buy links are going to be below, and check out Megan on social media. The links are below as well. Thank you so much for being on the channel, Megan. Thank you so much for having me, Carly.